Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the memorable career of Springbok legend Peter Hendricks. Peter, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much. It's a privilege. Uh, thanks for having me. Now, before we begin the conversation, let's take a look at the trivia question for this week. At the 2019 Rugby World Cup, who captained the Springboks in their pool match against Namibia? Now, if you know the answer, you can put it in the comment section down below, and we'll also find out if Peter knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Peter, I want to begin with your career at school. I know that you had blistering pace as a professional rugby player. Were you a champion sprinter at school by any chance? <laughs> yeah, uh, Peter, I was at a, a junior level in primary school. I was a um, South African ch uh, champion for uh, the short sprints. In those days, it was 150 meters and 100 meters. So, um, yeah, then I was a SA champion. Then at the high school level, um, under 19, I uh, changed over to hurdles. And I, um, at, uh, for a very short uh, period, I held the uh, South African record for 110 meter hurdles. Um, and I was South African champion for 110 meter hurdles. That's actually amazing. Um, Peter, let's fast forward then to your career as a Springbok. In 1992, when it was announced that South Africa would return to international rugby, what did you think were the chances that you would make that Springbok side? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, the guys who know me, um, they will say that I'm very arrogant and uh, but I see it as inner confidence. Uh, but um, I think to answer your question directly, I, I always thought that I had a very good chance because in 1991, um, they picked the Springbok team and we weren't allowed to play international rugby in, um, at that stage. In fact, we, we had a game against Namibia and I was in the Springbok team at, at, at that stage, but we didn't uh, get capped uh, for that game. And then in uh, 1992, I was selected to um, play in the uh, World 15 with the uh, Centenary uh, Festival in New Zealand, where we played three tests. Um, yeah, so I was already in, in, in that team. So at that stage, uh, the expectations were, from my side, were, were, were very positive um, and full of confidence. Uh, because we played in 91 already for the Springboks and then obviously being part of the uh, 92 World 15 in New Zealand. Um, so I, I, I always thought that um, I would be picked and I must be honest, if they did not pick me, I would have been very disappointed at that stage. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? So talk to me about how you were feeling just before kickoff against the All Blacks. It's always when people ask you the question, it is um, the same old cliche where you say it's the ultimate childhood dream to play against the All Blacks. But uh, the history um, of the, and the rivalry between the Springboks and the All Blacks, that was always uh, the big one. And I must say, um, I'm, I'm very pleased that my first official uh, international tests were all against the All Blacks. So I, I had the privilege of playing the three tests for the World 15 in New Zealand and to uh, um, understand what is uh, waiting for us on that day uh, at Alice Park. But uh, before the kickoff, it was just uh, a hell of a privilege to be able to represent South Africa and being at Alice Park, um, you know, and, and the national anthem and coming out of isolation where uh, there were no international rugby for a very long period in South Africa, that it was just um, the expectation from the whole country, you know, and, and to be part of the Springboks itself, it, it is a, it was a childhood dream that, that came true. And at that stage, um, because we did not, we were not allowed to participate in 89 in the, in the Rugby World Cup, um, and Tim Warren and Jason Little, those guys that were my age, they played in the uh, uh, um, previous World Cup in, in 91. Um, so for us, they weren't, they, there wasn't a bigger game than playing the All Blacks at Ellis Park. So obviously, to put it into words, for a lack of uh, my English vocabulary, uh, I'm not going to be able to express myself fully, but... It was, it was such a privilege and uh, amazing feeling 
and that was your dream. That was what you were waiting for. And I, I remember when we were standing there and you look at the crowds, um, you see these thousands of people and you see the passion um, and you know that you're representing your country and you represent every South African Springbok rugby supporter. And uh, I think f through the years, everybody will understand or agree that, um, especially after isolation, that Springbok support and to, and to be able to pull that uh, uh, jersey over your head, it was just nothing was bigger at that stage uh, for any youngster in South Africa. And for me, I was 22 years old at that stage. Um, there wasn't anything bigger. We weren't part of a, a world stage with a World Cup or anything like that. So, so that was the ultimate. And looking at that people and the atmosphere, it was just something out of this world. I had Ian McDonald on the show a couple of months ago, and he told me that one of the most difficult things at that stage for the guys was that there was not a lot of players in the squad that had actually played international rugby before. So except maybe for Nas Boerts and Dani Gerber, there wasn't really a core of senior guys that could give the youngsters advice and tell you what to expect and that sort of thing. What was your experience like? Yeah, I think Mac was 100% right when he said that. Um, the other players were Janni Breert, Uli Schmidt and Val Bartman. Those were the only ones with some sort of international uh, experience. Um, for us, um, at that stage, uh, when, when, like I said, I keep on referring back to the three tests in New Zealand. I saw that this is just another level, international rugby, you know, and, and I don't think we, we, we um, the team, or not think, I know that the team uh, wasn't ready uh, for what was coming. You know, we, we, we always, it, it didn't take long, or, or in fact, we could have won that game, uh, that first test. So we weren't far behind, but mentally, we were light years behind. You know, um, it is just the way the pressures up and the decision making, uh, that type of thing, when you play against players that played in two World Cups uh, uh, and, and finals and, and stuff like that, and all of a sudden you come with the inexperience and you, you're you excited that you're 22 years old, you want to try things. And um, we didn't have the experience to understand that it is a total, totally different uh, game. This is not uh, where you can just throw the ball around and the pressure is just 10 times more. And the time and space that you are allowed to make decisions is just taken away uh, by the pressure. So for us, it, 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 it was a, a huge, huge disadvantage um, for not being, having that, had that experience in the team to be able to make that split second decisions. And that comes only through experience. You will see it when you look at any team in the world, you get these brilliant youngsters and the first year was they achieve nothing in a, in, a, in a World Cup. And you look at France, for example, uh, for coming up this year, the previous World Cup inexperienced players, and all of a sudden they got more experience and, and, and they become sort of uh, one of the favourites. It was exactly the same for us. Going into that thing, um, I can tell the viewers that's watching is, is, is that people do not understand what experience means for the team. So we played against New Zealand the following week against Australia in Cape Town. And then you only played for the Springboks again in a test match uh, at the end of 1994. What happened? Throughout my career, I was, um, I think, unfortunate with, with serious injuries. Um, we went on the 92 uh, tour to France and where I uh, tore a hamstring. So I couldn't be picked for that one. Then it was out then, uh, 93, we came back. Um, in John Plumtree <laughs> in those days it was a little bit more physical and guys didn't get suspended so often so uh, um, he hit me and I broke my cheekbone and then I was out and then I came back and just before the uh, selections for the team to go to New Zealand that year then I broke my hand um, so yeah so I missed that the whole season and then 94 um, I was picked again uh, for the Springboks so I had, uh, in that period, I had two serious injuries. You spoke to me about your confidence ahead of the 1992 return to international rugby. Tell me about your confidence in 95 about making the World Cup squad. Initially, um, I, I, I didn't make the squad. <laughs> um, although in 93-94 in, in, uh, season, um, I still got the... Um, 
the record for the youngest player ever in South Africa to have played uh, 100 first-class games for a province. I think I was 24 and I still got the uh, um, first-class tries um, record. I don't know if it's 36 or 39. I stand to be corrected. Uh, first-class tries in, in one season. I still got the Curry Cup uh, record for the most tries. So at that stage, with that record and being part of the um, 94 team that were undefeated in Europe, I thought I had a very good chance of making it to the World Cup. And at that stage, all the teams picked three wingers. But South Africa, unfortunately, picked only two wingers. Um, Kids went for extra forward. Um, so I didn't make the initial squad. So I, I, I must be honest, I was very, very disappointed when I didn't make the initial squad. But then the... Uh, back door opened and uh, Jesse got injured. Um, he pulled the hamstring and um, I got in through the back door. And um, yeah, so I was very pleased to be part of it. And I must say that with the builder, um, I was always part of the team. Uh, the squad, uh, I worked with them. We trained with them, the preparation for the World Cup. It was just, um, Chester was injured uh, during that period, so I never um, uh, was sent home. I was still part of the squad because there was a very good chance that Chester wouldn't make it with his hamstring. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very uh, grateful for that, that I could have been part of the whole build-up and the, the hard work of the team and everything, and eventually yeah, um, I was part of it. So how were you feeling before that first uh, game, that opening game against the Wallabies? Yeah, look, I think that feeling started... Uh, well before the, the, the opening game itself, I think uh, uh, build up, uh, having it in Cape Town and Cape Town got a lot of uh, support. Uh, so we'll look, all of South Africa always had a lot of uh, rugby support, but especially Cape Town, the build up to it, um, it was just crazy. You know, the people were carrying you on their hands literally and, and, and you were treated like um, heroes already, although you've not, won nothing. But, uh, um, yeah, so, so that was amazing. And, and something I, I, I want to put in is that, um, you know, uh, you ask me what was the feeling before the game. Um, I must refer to the confidence of the team. You know, a lot of uh, 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 rugby uh, writers and stuff like that uh, said that. And people always, when they refer back, they say that South Africa weren't favourites at that stage which I think is absolute nonsense. Um, if you look back, um, the core of that uh, 95 team was uh, the Lions or the Transvaal squad at that stage with 13 players in it and uh, being um, added the, the best of South Africa, what we got to offer. And you look back in, in, in 93, the first time that the Super Series started, it was a Super 10. And the Transvaal team won the Super 10 with 10 Springboks in the final against the... Uh, the All Blacks, who at that stage in 95 were the favourites together with Australia to win it. And we beat them uh, in South Africa uh, in a final where the likes of Sean Fitzpatrick, Zinzan Brook, Robin Brook, Michael Jones, um, all those guys, Frank Bunch, Walter Little, they were all in a team. You know, So we convincingly beat them at Ellis Park. Um, we beat New, uh, New South Wales and Queensland um, during the Super 10 series of uh, that same year. And then also the same with the Super uh, uh, 10 in, in uh, or Super 12, I think it was Super 10 or Super 12 in 94 series, where we lost in the final. You know, so, and then we, we went on tour to Europe and we come back unbeaten from a away tour. And you go into the World Cup having dominated Super Rugby at that stage, the Transvaal team together with the Natal team um, and people referring to us as underdogs, I think, uh, was, was, was maybe a silly comment. So we were very, very confident going into that game. And on the day of the game, yes, Sam, I mean, that was crazy. The streets were just filled with supporters and having a ride at the stadium. That's something that if you weren't in that bus and you weren't part of it, you will never be able to describe to the people how mad it was, what a madhouse. And then having had Nelson Mandela there and uh, New South Africa after 94, going into 95, it was just something out of this world. And I remember standing on the, on the, on the field 
and you can hear the passion when the people uh, sang the national anthem and after the opening ceremony when we were in the change room and you could hear the opening ceremony is yeah there's something crazy going out yeah I mean that team was so ready for it it was totally different to being uh, 92 where we played Australia at Newlands where we lost in the rain we got a quite a good hiding all of a sudden we had experience in the team and we had a lot of confidence coming out of the Super Rugby. So, yeah, I, I don't think for one moment it's arrogant, but I don't think for one moment that uh, the team itself doubted that we could win the World Cup. Okay, Peter, the moment that forever secured your place in the hearts of all South Africans, you received the ball out on the left wing, as it turns out, rounding David Campisi to score our first try at a Rugby World Cup. Describe that moment for me in your own words. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for In my own words, I don't know if all your viewers will understand the word uh, it is something that uh, South Africans will understand. That's when you're a little bit too uh, full of yourself and maybe too much confidence. Um, but I... I I respect David Campisi and I got the utmost respect for him. I remember in 91 when we watched the World Cup, when we, he was player of the World Cup uh, series in 91, I had added a poster um, and we weren't allowed to participate because of apartheid in that World Cup. And uh, he was uh, my one of my heroes that I looked up to, uh, having looked at this poster and, and now you get the opportunity to do it finally in the World Cup. I had the opportunity to play against David in 92 and 93, 94 in the, in the Super Series. And one thing I will say, and I say it with the utmost respect, is that David wasn't uh, known for the, the, a great defender. He was a good defender and uh, attacking with ball in hand um, and a game changer, maybe the best, one of the best the world has ever seen. So um, I never had sleepless nights playing against him. Um, you, you had to be wide awake when he, he's got the ball because the goose step and all that stuff and the speed and he can at any time, any day he could beat anybody. But in the past, um, I, I had to, uh, once or twice, I, I, I did beat him ball in hand where um, Matthew Perry or, or Matthew Burke, one of those guys would tackle you once you beat him. So unfortunately for David that day, um, there was just too much space. And um, when, when Yarpi Mulder uh, threw that long pass and, and, and James Small uh, gave it to me a little bit behind me, um, David found himself a little bit out of position in the no man's land. And uh, fortunately for me, um, when you got that much space out wide, when you hesitate, you're dead. And that was just, I, I managed to create that little bit of hesitation where you didn't know whether I'm going inside or out. And... Um, or maybe straight. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it just worked for me. And, and when you hesitate, it's like someone, when you take a flyer in 100 meters, when you get out the blocks before the other one, you're gone. And that's just what happened. Uh, I managed to take off before he could take off, and uh, the rest was history. And it really was. Uh, and after that, we beat Romania in what was quite a tough match, followed by Canada uh, in what has become uh, maybe one of the more infamous matches uh, in Springbok and Rugby World Cup history. And, you know, things didn't necessarily go your way against Canada, Peter. Uh, just again, in your own words, what happened there? When you play a World Cup, whether it's against Canada or whether it's against Romania, or what there's always pressure in the game. And at that stage... Um, with the build-up, we knew that Canada cannot beat us. They can only spoil your game. And we saw it against Australia and everybody where they were just physical. They played the players off the ball. And um, going into the game, uh, with that in mind, the pack that we picked and the game pattern that we picked with Johan Ruud scrum off, it, we were just going to kick because we know what was coming. Um, in the warm-up session, the, the lights went out. There was a power failure. Um, then we warmed up, we went onto the field and the power failure again, you come back again. And having all that in the background um, and the tension and the build-up, and now you're coming up against a team who, who doesn't want to play rugby, they can they can play negative rugby, they can spoil it. And I mean it also with respect, um, maybe they didn't have enough, uh, I, I won't say, they were at that stage not a 
considered to be a, a, a top team in the world. So that was a type of rugby that they can play, uh, try and slow you and waiting for you to make mistakes and try and keep the score low as possible. So that's what happened in that game. And then obviously during the game, there were a lot of tackles off the ball and bumping. And I remember um, running towards the side and I came in to tackle the winger. I can't remember his name. Um, and he... We grabbed each other, I ran into him and we grabbed each other by the collar and we were standing against the advertising boards and he tried to push me into the advertising board and all of this that I'm telling you happens like in 11, 12 seconds. Okay, so having build up and playing the test and <laughs> being full of testosterone at that stage of your life, um, when he tried to push me into the advertising boards, I turned him around and I, and I held him by the collar um, and then Reese, the fullback, came in and he, he came and he hit me from behind. And uh, I mean, at that stage, I was just provoked. And, and, and I'm, I will admit, I'll take the responsibility that I lost a little bit of cool because when you're standing there and somebody hit you from behind, you're just furious. And I turned around, but we I still had the winger by the collar and he had me. And I turned around and then James Dalton came running in and he just ran Reese off me into the advertising boards. And James Dalton never threw a punch or anything like that. But he's the player who ran in, so unfortunately, but uh, yeah, for him. Um, and then uh, James having dropped the guy with, when he tackled him sort of into the boards, I turned around and I was furious. I was looking for this guy who, who came to eat me from behind. And um, the, guy, the winger had me by the collar, so I couldn't get down to eat him. <laughs> so, at that stage, I just let the kick go, and the kick was missed, uh, fortunately, because I think if that kick connected, there would have been big trouble. So the kick was missed, and then uh, all hell broke out, and the guys just came in running, eating from all sides, and then LaRue came in, and he dropped, um, I think, Reese the fullback. He dropped him, and uh, the winger still had me by the collar, so I threw a, a left punch, which I'm very proud of. I think it was a good one that connected properly. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, so then the fullback dropped here by my feet. And like I said, this was madness in 11 seconds. And um, I, I, I was still furious. I wanted to really, in the context, kill the guy who hit me from behind. And uh, he was lying here, so I kicked. And I kicked him against the neck. Um, but as I kicked, I realized cameras. And then I started to come to my senses. Okay, so it, it's was like not a proper kick as well <laughs> for the furiousness I had at that stage. But in any case, so everybody hit. And then um, when things calmed down, uh, Reese the fullback and James Dalton, they got uh, red carded and they got sent off. And then uh, the next morning, uh, Rudolf Strauli came to me and he said to me, um, I'm going to be cited. And out of the whole fight, with everybody throwing punches and that, I was the only guy um, who was cited uh, out of the whole thing. The following year, 1996, uh, you were still in the Springbok side. Andre Markroff had become the Springbok coach at that stage. But the results didn't really go our way. We actually struggled in the Tri-Nations. Uh, and then we played the All Blacks in a three-test series and we became the first uh, Springbok team to lose to them in a series on home soil. Why do you think the team struggled in '96? After the World Cup, when we were the first ones to go the professional route, and what the public don't know about is all the politics behind the scenes and uh, um, the fights we had with Louis Late and the difficulty. Um, because remember, we were amateurs and guys had jobs, and then all of a sudden you got given uh, nice big contracts, and the contracts there was a fight between the players and uh, Sarfu, uh, or Saru, Dr. Lou Late, um, where he didn't know that we signed uh, contracts um, with, um, uh, uh, um, I think it was Packers, Broadcast Corporations and stuff like that, and, and Murdoch was involved, and it was a big rivalry. And then uh, Dr. Late came back from overseas, and we were all called uh, Saxon Wilty's house there, and... He didn't know that we all signed the contract. So there was a lot of, I'm going to keep you busy for hours to go into detail, but uh, there was a lot of um, bad blood between uh, Saru and especially Dr. Lou Late and the players itself. 
um, where you remember that the Transvaal team, I was suspended at that stage. Um, yeah, you know, I had a, a 90 day suspension for my part in the World Cup, and that's why end of 95, I also missed the Springbok tour. Um, I couldn't play because I was still suspended for three months. Um, so Francois Pinard was a, was a captain, and he was a very good captain. And at that stage, uh, when Dr. Leighton then decided uh, to drop him, uh, he left for Saracens. And it was just instead of keeping that core of team together with that experience that is so important to build them, because the players were young enough for the next World Cup, the core of players, it was just, um, it was a fight between basically Dr. Light uh, and Saru and uh, the Springbok team of 95, of which the core was that 13 Transvaal players. So unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, the players uh, uh, left. And for example, when we played uh, back then, the Super 12 um, games, uh, Rian also would inform us before we play Otago the evening, before we play them in New Zealand, that uh, we're going to have to leave our jobs when we get back to South Africa and we're going to be full-time with Saru and they're going to tell us what to do. And, but it wasn't done in good faith. It was all threatens. It was their lawyers uh, sending letters to say that uh, some of the players, for example, in their contracts, which were a little bit older players, their contract stated that there was never performance clauses in those contracts. So it stated that uh, the performance clause was to you, a clause was to the best of your ability. So their lawyers would send uh, letters to say that you're not playing to your ability anymore. And then some of the team players, uh, lawyers would respond and say, but they have the opinion that they're playing to their ability because as you get older, your ability gets older. Or, or gets uh, it gets more difficult. So um, that was the, the the type of political fights that was behind the scenes. And that team, instead of becoming a happy family, it was just a, 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 not even a love hate situation. It was just hatred all over the place. And you cannot train and operate and work under those conditions. Uh, your marriage were influenced. Players um, had to stop their jobs and become professional. And I just think that the whole thing, the way that uh, um, South African rugby handled it was very, very unprofessional because coming out of a, a, a amateur era, going into a professional era, there weren't really professional sports in South Africa. You know, we were the first and we were semi-professional back then. And yeah, so that was a mess and that's why um, to come back to 96 season, uh, we were, you're right, we were the first to lose a, a, a series and that was also my last test for the Springboks at Ellis Park. Luckily, we won uh, that last one at Ellis Park against the All Blacks. But um, unfortunately, that was a reality. People might think that the team didn't perform well, but it was all, it's no surprise that all those political things and and. I know this hasn't been a lot being said in the open, like maybe I'm uh, letting you in on today, but that was uh, uh, really what was going on behind the scenes. Terrible stuff, actually, uh, when you think about it. Um, Peter, tell me, uh, what are you up to these days? Um, yeah, myself and Ray Mort, I think the people will remember him. Uh, we've been together in business for 30 years. Uh, we've got a hydraulic engineering company, uh, Sezonke Hydraulics, where we manufacture and recondition hydraulic cylinders, pumps, valves, and motors. So I'm marketing director um, at Sezonke Hydraulics, and we're very blessed, I must say. Um, I thank the good Lord for that. And then also one of my big passions is uh, farming. You know, I always wanted to farm. And uh, so with that rugby money, when we were the first ones to go a professional route, and I'm also very thankful that I could have been part of that because I stopped playing at 27 through a bad knee injury. But luckily, the insurance paid me out and I got that money. I bought some uh, farmland between Stanerton and Amersfoort and the Eiffelt, um, where my son is now full-time farming, uh, MPS farming for us. Uh, we're farming some uh, maize and soyas and uh, some cattle and a little bit of sheep. So I'm very blessed that this... Um, it's becoming a little bit of a, a, a stressful situation where in the past it was just something that I enjoyed, but 
uh, that's life. We're very really fortunate, and um, yeah. So I'm also I'm, I'm very happily married with my wife Erica. Um, we've been married uh, this year also 30 years, um, and my daughter Wilmaine, uh, she's studying uh, medicine, and uh, yeah, she's still in the house. So we we overall uh, Peter Enrich is, is is a very blessed man. Sounds good to me. Peter, before I let you go, we need to look at the trivia question again quickly. At the 2019 Rugby World Cup, who captained the Springboks in their pool match against Namibia? Do you know the answer, Peter? I got no clue. I don't know if even XFF played or what, but I'm going to let you give the answer. <laughs> All right. The correct answer is Skulk Brits, and he actually played at number eight in that match. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, I remember that. I did follow it, and... Uh... Yeah, I remember it. Peter, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future. No, Peter, I must say it was it was a hell of a privilege for me and an honor to be on your show. And uh, one thing, because um, we as ex-players not always get a platform where we can say and express something. Uh, but what I do want to express is that I, I do believe that or I, I do uh, um, want to desperately ask uh, IRB to say, have a look at the new rules that you're bringing in because you're really messing up the game with the red cards and the yellow cards and this high tackle and contact to the head because rugby is a contact sport to avoid contact at all times with a necessary skill and get the ball behind the goal line. But I do appeal to IRB to get their house in order and sort out the grey areas and uh, not let our rugby game go the route of soccer where you get a lot of uh, guys pretending to be injured and do realize that the players are professional and the players that uh, uh, decide to, to play for money, um, they must know it's like uh, when you go into cage fighting, you know what you sign up for. And I'm not saying rugby must become cage fighting, but uh, I just think that the IRB has made it a very soft game and a very frustrating game to watch and a very difficult game to read for the referees and players to play. And I think we'd all agree with that. Peter, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Peter. Good day, sir. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had former Springbok centre Heinrich Fulz on the show. You can go and have a look at that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, we'll have former Springbok centre Tabani Bobo here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.